Some of you might have met Bob Johnson before. He has been here several times. We are very honored that you are here and you are going to present your radical approach Absolutely. or your human approach. Something. Let's start by giving Bob a big hand and welcome. Mangatak, Alan. Mangatak, Annette. Mangatak, Jorn Eriksson. A Manatak, Peter Bullimore. Some of you know him. Now, I'm a contradiction in terms, okay? I'm a happy psychiatrist, okay? <laughs> Radical, stupid, eccentric, happy. No. I'm so enthusiastic, I talk very fast. So when I talk too fast, I want you to do this. Slow down. Come on, come on. Ah, it's better, it's not difficult, come on. Smashing. I'm going to do half an hour of slides, and then half an hour of video. Because it's important for you to see people changing. See why they change. That's the plan. But before I start, I'm going to give you 100% of psychiatry in 30 seconds. Okay? Uh, 35 seconds. I discovered a gold mine for psychiatry 33 years ago, and my task is to hand you the key. Okay? So, here we are, September 1986. I'm sitting in my clinic, my special clinic, and there are three people. Three people. Me, Mary. Mary is 45. She's been having mental health problems all her life. And there's an empty chair. It's an empty chair to you, it's an empty chair to me, it's not an empty chair to Mary. Mary and I have agreed that we seat a picture, an image, a figment of her father. So she's chatting away, chatting away to me, chatting away to me. Then she turns to me and says, uh, what do I have to say to the chair? Um, listen carefully. Hello, Dad. I'm terrified of you. I don't need to be because I'm an adult. So she says that. As clear as I've said it now. Turns to the chair, nothing. She tell it to you, but not the chair. What's happening? The mind is broken. Briefly, but broken. She cannot talk, she cannot think straight. So anything can come out. I was going to make a political joke here. Why not? If you listen to the great United Kingdom Prime Minister, anything comes out. Garbage. Anyway, so, don't say Brexit, my blood pressure goes up. So here we have what I think is one of the most important dialogues in the last 40 years. It's between me and a prisoner. Now, all being well, technology forgiving, I will show you a video of this, but I wanted to show you this dialogue. I want you to look very carefully at it. I say to Lenny, sit your mother in the empty chair. What would you say? What would you talk? What would you get your frontal lobes and your speech center around? He says, I'd say, Mother, you can't hit me anymore. I am an adult. I can see he's an adult. Six foot three. Two meters, nearly two meters. And I then say, because I'm very rude, you see, haha. <laughs> I say, and you believe that? 
and he says, partly. You see, he's not thinking straight. Everybody else knows he's an adult. He doesn't. And you partly believe that and partly don't. I hope to show the video of that, as I say. Right, this is where we are. Some answers, if you listen to me, it's the answer. But you don't have to listen to me. You have to try it for yourself and see. This is Ethan, a few seconds old, 20 seconds old. Every human infant is powerless. You were, I was. How long do you remain powerless? That is psychiatry. What mental health should do is to empower. Everybody is born powerless. Everybody should have adult power to deal with. Sanity is replacing infant impotence with adult potency. You can't deny that every human infant is paraplegic. That's to say they can't move their, any of their limbs. They are powerless. You leave them over there and they are dead. And they know that. And they scream, do not leave me here. I am going to die without you. Every infant. Parental care keeps them alive, and they know that. However, the parent's job is to transfer responsibility, empowerment, autonomy, or as I like to say, replacing social defeat with social delight. If you are an adult, and you go through life saying, what I really need is a good parent, sort out all these problems, you are sunk. Uh, don't talk to people, they are nasty. Social contacts are dangerous. This is what you have been taught. This is called social defeat. It is the only psychiatric diagnosis I will allow. Schizophrenia, bipolar, out. Social defeat. Remedy? Persuade, educate, social delight. Here we go. Why psychiatry cripples doctors? What are we doing wrong? What breaks minds? How can you start mending them if you don't know why, what is broken? But we need to know what mends them. What are we doing wrong? Well, I'm not going to put them all down. You have fake news about genes. Oh, for goodness sake. I worked for five years in Parkhurst Prison. That's where this uh, video comes from. The violence was regular. Alarm bells were rung 20 times in a year. Okay? Very dangerous people. The most dangerous prisoners in the UK prison system were in this special unit. For three years, there were no alarm bells. The violence had gone. Why? They grew up emotionally. Violence is an infantile tantrum. Oh, that's all right, their genes changed. What? <laughs> their brain chemicals changed. What? How? <laughs> Don't start me. And they're neglecting human rights. Hello, you have human rights. Your views need to be respected. What we heard this morning was people respecting decisions, asking consent. Consent empowers. What breaks minds? It's very straightforward. We are none of us supermen or superwomen. You increase the stress and you will break down. 
You will hallucinate. Put somebody in a sleep deprivation situation, sensory desperation, they will hallucinate. They will become psychotic. And you know why. Unreliable parenting. If you were brought up, not necessarily by psychopaths, as Niels, but if you were brought up by people who thought all adults were as powerless as infants, how are you going to learn different from other people? And you learn social defeat. Don't talk to people. They betray you. Don't talk to people. They are violent. Don't talk to people. They will let you down. What men's minds? The truth. The truth is you are no longer an infant. The truth is you have capabilities. Not Superman, but capabilities. You need to be trust. You need to convey trust. You need to be trustworthy. And you need consent. I put this in because I'm a literary sort of chap. This is an excerpt from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, chapter 47. Mrs. Bennet, tell him what a dreadful state I am in, that I am frighted out of my wits and have such tremblings, such flutterings all over me, such spasms. As a family doctor, you hear this regularly. These symptoms are real. The person with them doesn't know where they come from. The person with them doesn't want to know where they come from. You have to work out where they come from and tell them it no longer applies. Now these are some questions. How do you get the courage to tell about experiences you promised never to tell yourself? The child, growing up, something dreadful happens, mum dies, dad beats them, whatever it is, the child says, this isn't happening to me. The child can't say, just a minute, in the United Nations uh, representative, no, the child said, this isn't happening to me. How do you get the courage to remember what you pushed out of your memory? That's what the child does. The child said, this is terrible. Oh, phew, thank goodness it's out of my mind. How do you dare to confront the voices and images with the reality the psychosis represents. I don't think the psychosis represents a reality. It's an alternative. It's an escape. How do you trust another person again? How do you hold on to and dare to believe that you were not wrong and sick, but have reacted to difficult experiences in life? Guess who wrote that? I'm not going to tell you. Those are the key words. Courage. Dare. Trust and dare. You see, the irony is, if you go to a psychiatrist and he says, I don't know, you're going to go away guys saying, I don't know either. If you go to a psychiatrist like me and I said, just a minute, how old are you? Did you say 82? Well, repeat after me, I'm 82 and I need my mother to love me. Now, if you're in the right seam, that becomes a shock and they start thinking. All psychiatry in three words. Why not? They're not listening to me anyway, so why not do it? <laughs> All children are impressionable. You, you, you're going to dispute that? Anybody here? Hmm? Hmm? No. Abuse a child and he stays abused all his life. Why should he change? The thing which abused him terrifies him. He can't think about it. Neglect a child, she stays neglected all her life. Until, guess what? Rescued, retrained, empowered. Now what you will find universally with people who are suffering mental ill health that they want a nice mummy. They want a nice daddy. Because they haven't had one. That's why they're in the state they are. If you parent them, you are doing a disservice. Your task is to empower them, not to control them. Inside every insane person is the same person trying to get out. It's your job to show them how. All right, this is a new one, this one is. Bessel's Law. All broken minds come from broken frontals. Speechless terror is the disease. All you have to do is turn off the thinking and garbage comes out. 
Have you been following the news in the United States recently? Yes. <laughs> I didn't say it, I didn't say it. A smile a day keeps the doctor away. I have to tell you a little story about that. I'm blessed with six grandchildren, and the youngest is now ten. And we have a, a communal breakfast. And my wife was out of the room, so I thought, well, I'll tell you what, I'll talk about things I want to talk about. So I said, well, I've written this book in which I write down, A Smile A Day Keeps the Doctor Away. And this 10-year-old says, hmm, A Smile A Day Keeps the Psychologist Away. And both her parents are psychologists. I don't know where she got that from. <laughs> now then, to restore frontal lobes and reverse frontalitis, well, why not, eh? You have to be what? You have to be stronger than the abuser. You have to know that you are not frightened of the abuser. For many years, I was frightened of my father. He wasn't a dangerous man. He was uh, an Edwardian. He was a strict schoolmaster. And he was benign below, but he frightened me. He had a bad temper. And I couldn't confront parental figments in the people who came to see me because I was not stronger than him. And then I was. And once I was, I could deal with them. But you have to be safe as well. Now, overgrown infants know that everybody is dangerous. They've never met anybody they can trust. They've never met anybody in power who asked their consent. You have to be 100% trustworthy, reliable, honest, and adult. Not parental, adult. non coercive non-parental. Now then, this is a picture of a mentally ill monkey. That's the uh, rubric. He's actually biting itself, and we know why. That monkey had no parents. A man called Harlow thought, I tell you what, we'll try bringing up monkeys without parents. And that's the result. There he is. Why don't the psychiatrists look at that? Well, we don't, have, we don't have time for that. Now then, this is what actually happens to the drugs. See the one at the bottom there? Always on the drugs, 72% have psychotic symptoms. Never on the drugs, 7%. Fantastic. The treatment we're doing is ten times worse than not doing anything. That's the reference for people who want to follow it up, but I wouldn't bother. Nobody takes any notice of it. That was published in 2014. There we go. Five years ago. It's had a dramatic effect on psychiatry. Ooh, I can hardly say that. Unbelievable. Dementia. This is a Swedish study. Dementia is the next pandemic. You listen to the public health experts and they say, dementia is on the way. So, let's find out what causes it. Let's look at nearly half a million Swedish conscripts over 50 years. If you gave them antipsychotics, you increased the hazard ratio by 2.75. This is less than you'd expect by chance. Who is responsible for this drug abuse? The risk of premature dementia at around 54 years, this is what the paper says, increases 20-fold with two or more of nine independent risk factors. If you want to check that out, have a look at the Journal of the American Medical Association, Internal Medicine, but don't expect psychiatrists to look at it. <laughs> Quick run through my work at Parkhurst. These are the treatments. What you've got when I arrived is 3.5 kilograms of tranquilizers per annum. There was no data there. Then the computer kicked in in the pharmacy and it went down to 150 milligrams. These are the assaults. Lots and lots of assaults when it was first set up. Almost one a fortnight. Then they leveled out. And then guess what? Bang! Somebody comes in and says, you can grow up if you want to. You don't have to do this nursery stuff. You can talk to people instead of hitting them. In fact, one of them said, he got married at 18, 
And he talked with his fists. He couldn't talk with his mouth. So there were no alarm bells rung for three years. So naturally they closed the unit. <laughs> now then, this is my view, okay? On the left you have the lesion, the trauma, what you can't do, and what cures it, right? So say you broke your arm. Oof, you broke your arm. How did you do it? You fell over. You didn't deliberately fall over. It was trauma imposed on you from the outside. That's what trauma does. What can't you do? You can't write. Nobody thinks that's unusual. We like to sign this, well, I can't, I can't move my arm. What's the cure? Knit the bones, physiotherapy. That's not controversial. You go to the outpatient clinic, the fracture clinic, that's what they'll do to you. And that's what you'll consent. You can still tell the doctor, well, I was going along on my bike, as you do in Denmark, and I fell over, blah, 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 etc. However, what about a broken mind, eh? This is where it gets exciting. It's what happened to you. There you are. Boom! Not self-inflicted. Not what's wrong with you, what happened to you. You can't think. You're suffering from speechless terror. What cures it? Social contacts. Verbal physiotherapy. Come on now, you can do it. I'll hold your hand while you say to dad, back off, or whatever. You're quite unable to tell the doctor. In order to tell the doctor, you have to have frontal lobes and speech center which work. What does trauma do? Turns them off. What's the evidence for that? Brain scan evidence. You're quite unable to tell the doctor, speechless terror stops the brain center working. Standard medical approach doesn't work. Speechless terror is Bessel van der Kolk's phrase. I used to call it frozen terror. And then I read uh, um, Bessel's uh, brain scan, which is solid, concrete, scientific evidence. You can't think, you can't talk when trauma is in your mind. The standard approach doesn't work. You go to the doctor and say, I'm not going to tell you about my chest pain. What? What? Uh, I want you to diagnose me. Maybe I've got heart disease, but I'm not telling you about the chest pain. What? So you go, and I feel depressed. I feel bipolar. I feel I'm not going to tell you about my mum dying when I was three. I'm not going to tell you about that. What? You have to work it out. It's wonderful when you do, and you see people blossoming. I mean, it's wonderful. No, this is the remnant of the moniker, the, the uh, symbol we had for a small mental health charity, and that's the motto. This one you've seen, that's the thing, and they say... The, the DSM has become a monster. So naturally, the psychiatrists say, well, we mustn't use it anymore. <sighs> Where are these psychiatrists li living? Why don't they read what everybody else is? Now, this is something I always show. This is a, a front of the Sunday Times magazine, and you know why these people, these children, are going to turn into addicts, violent criminals, alcoholic. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. We are not clockwork machines, using social delight to cure social defeat. That's me, and the qualifications there are 50 pounds each. Now, this is something I'm working on now. This is a biology lesson. Everybody knows that uh, lightning is wild electrons. Not many people appreciate that wheat fields are tame electrons. We eat same electrons. I haven't time for that now, but now then, here we have Professor Bessel van der Kolk. He calls his book, The Body Keeps the Score. It's not the body keeping the score, it's the frontal lobes being unable to reconsider. So if I can manage to uh, play the video, he says in it about ways to help traumatized patients find their way back which implies they were all right and they need to come back. I happen to be lucky, just read the last bit. When people remember their trauma, the whole of the frontal lobes goes offline. The frontal lobes give up. Part of their brain has to do with thinking goes offline. This is him, this is him talking. 
I observed this clinically. He's proving it. Brain scan. The speech centre goes offline. They are struck with speechless terror. That's the phrase that comes up. Why doesn't this signify? Why don't the doctors say, wow, that's why I don't understand. That's why they can't explain. Just a few quickies. Personality disorder. Crap. It's a perception disorder. They perceive everybody else as ogres. Because that's what they were taught. So you say, no, no, we're not ogres. We're fallible human beings like you. Listen to Annette this morning. It's all right. I can help you. Psychotic disorder, are you psychotic for life? No. You're socially defeated and you need social delight. For all, okay? Stuff the genes. The task for us all. Everyone is born lovable, sociable, and non violent. That's what they taught me in the prison. They didn't want to be violent. There were 50 murderers that went through the unit. They didn't want to murder. They murdered because their lives were threatened by misperception. When you say, you can tell them to back off, and they believed you, the violence evaporated. Parenting keeps infants alive. We all know that. The Spartans used to leave the unwanted children on the hillside. That was it. But it keeps adults insane. Truth, trust and consent. Truth is what is really out there. It's never 100%, but we all have a model of what's going on, and we keep having to refresh it, keep having to bring it up to date. Trust is the antidote to fear. If somebody said, there's a tiger next door, it's coming in, and I said, no, it isn't. Who are you going to trust? The fear goes if you trust me and I'm real. You rely on another's truth. Not easy. And when you're dealing with people who have never trusted anyone in their lives, it's difficult. And consent empowers. Those are the three pillars of peace of mind. Now, this is the dialogue I've already been through. Now, this is an interesting uh, program. 2nd of May, 2017. The, uh, the doctor said it's about 10% genetics, which, which is all right. 35% social defeat. That's, he was talking about psychotic symptoms. There he is. Now these are the videos. So this is uh, Ethan sticking out his tongue, right? I want to show you a video of that. He's 17 minutes old. You've got a newborn baby reacting socially. That's how we're born, we're social beings. Hello, Dad. Mm. Right? I didn't do that to my children, I regret it. Ethan is joining a social conversation. Ethan is benefiting from social contact. Right. Now then, this is one of my faves, right? This is from a group of two people with psychotic symptoms, right? Thought disorder is pathognomonic. That's to say, if you listen to somebody, starts a sentence, breaks a sentence, starts another sentence, that in the textbook says this is a psychotic symptom. What I say is the frontal lobes and the speech center aren't working. So here we have Frida, okay? She says, I can't think. I can't think properly. Right? I'll play the, the audio with a bit of luck. Right? This obviously is part of the educative process on my part. I'm training her to have a look at her problem, and this is what she's concluded. So I say, it's training, right? You've trained yourself not to think. Mm, she says. Not very good. So I say, say that. This is verbal physiotherapy. This is you exercise your speech center. So she says, I've, 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 I've trained. I have. I have, I, I've trained myself not to think, okay? That's called blocking. So she says, and then I say straight away, and now I have to train myself to think. And she says, and now I have to train myself to think. No blocking at all. The frontal lobes have started. 
This is the essence of psychotic symptoms. Here, they are going away. The trauma triad. I developed this to encourage the person to confront the abuser. Again, don't try this at home. Don't try it unless you have a very, very trustworthy, secure situation. As Robert Whittaker would say, you have to have the right external environment. You do. But what you say, you sit the person, the user down in an empty chair and you say, what you did was wrong. I'm very angry with you for doing it and I'm going to stop you doing it again. Now an infant could never say that. An overgrown adult infant could never say that. An adult should say it without a second thought. Let's try one or two videos, shall we? See what happens. Everyone knows that babies are amazing. But sometimes it's easy to forget just how amazing they are. Right from the moment they're born, babies are acutely attuned to the world around them. They know what they like and what they don't like. And most astonishingly of all, they're able to communicate with other people just seconds after birth. Within a few minutes of birth, as long as everything has gone well, babies are ready and willing to be social and sociable. Ethan is just a few seconds old here. He's crying as the midwife passes him back to mum. As soon as he's in mum's arms, he begins to settle. Within 10 seconds, he's calm and quiet. A few moments later, Mum offers Ethan her breast, but Ethan's much more interested in looking at Mum's face. Did you hear that? As soon as it's in Mum's arms, it begins to settle. He knows. He knows it's dangerous. He knows it's safe. She talks to him. He clearly responds. When his dad speaks, Ethan turns to him. And when Mum replies, Ethan looks back up at her. Ethan already knows these voices, and he knows they're important to him. Did you hear that? He knows these voices. You see, Mum's wall, wall, abdominal wall isn't soundproof, you see. They can hear what's going on. A little later, Ethan really shows us what he can do when he's put in his dad's arms. When John sticks his tongue out, Ethan looks hard, concentrates, and then sticks out his own tongue. Ethan does the same thing again a moment or so later. I was taught as a medical student the newborn babies were like lumps of wood. They couldn't hear very well, they couldn't focus, and so why bother? Wrong. Why don't the psychiatrists look at this? I'm not going to tell you the answer to that. This is curing childhood traumas. Children can learn things which can stick for a lifetime. Lenny needs to learn to tell his mother he's an adult. This is a long-term lifer. He's committed murder. He's sitting in this special unit for especially unstable, violent, uh, indisciplined uh, lifers. I don't tell him to murder his mother. He doesn't want to murder his mother. He wants to tell his mother the truth. Well, it's about my mother. How she used to batter me when I was a kid. Did you get that? It's about my mother, how she used to batter me when I was a kid. I haven't said, I've asked him what we're talking about, and that's what he said. The battering comes first. This is about the fifth or sixth session with him. I needed that time to get enough confidence to ask him ask his consent, enough confidence that he would say yes, to be videoed. What effect did this have on you? Well, it made me frightened. Did it? Yeah. Well, what happened with the fear? It's embedded. Still there, is it? Yeah. It doesn't help you, does it? No. So what effect does this embedded fear have? It made me violent. Did it? 
Yeah. How does that work? I don't know. Why, why, is, why does embedded fear make you violent? Why does embedded fear make you violent? Well, she used violence on, on me all the time and uh, I grew up to violence, didn't I? You know what I mean? But you're a big lad, you're an adult, so why are you still frightened your mother? It's still there, isn't it? I'm still there, yeah. She used violence on me all the time. I grew up to violence. It's called education, or in this case, miseducation. So what I'm doing there, as a keen idealist psychiatrist, I'm saying, anger's fine, violence isn't. You can say, don't do that again, then you can get angry. But don't hit. Hit is for kindergarten. Hit is for infantile tantrums. And here he's saying it. She brought me up to violence. And the violence stopped him thinking. So why hasn't it changed? Why is it still there, do you think? Well, it's, it's a whole part of growing up, isn't it? Well, if he hasn't, done not it? Yeah. Well, it's still stuck there, because we've talked about this morning, haven't we? Yeah. Why is the violence still there? Why is the fear still there? And as he says, Part of me hasn't grown up. He's telling me my model. Part of me hasn't grown up. Grow that part up, the violence evaporates. Yeah. Being an adult, can you tell you're an adult? Yeah, I've got to try. You'd find it difficult? Yeah. You would, wouldn't you? I would. Could yeah. you tell your mother you're an adult? Oh, well, I could try. What? My job is to give him enough confidence to tell his mother the truth, and him. Do you find that surprising that you find it difficult to tell your mother you're an adult? Yeah, very, very surprising. It is, isn't it? Would you find it surprising that you find it difficult to tell your mother an adult? See, now we're on the same side looking at his problem. We weren't to begin with. I was a feared psychiatrist about to do dangerous things to him. But now he trusts me and we're looking at the problem. So I say, is that surprising? I mean, you're a big lad. What's going on? Why can't you tell your mother the truth? Is that surprising? I'm drawing out a human reaction. So what would stop it? Say, if your mother was sitting over there, what would you say to her? What would stop it if your mother was sitting over there? The empty chair again. I do love the empty chairs. That's her, your mother. You can't sit me anymore. I am an adult. See? Mother, you can't hit me anymore. I'm an adult. Now, when he believes that, his mother, the figment of his mother from long ago, disappeared. Can you believe that? Yeah, partly. <laughs> See? The word partly, okay? I hang my reputation <laughs> on the word partly. <laughs> you partly believe it, partly don't? Yeah. Is that right? I don't know that I could say it to her or not. What, what would stop you? Fear. What would stop you telling your mother you're an adult? What would stop you thinking straight? What would stop you talking straight? Fear. What's the remedy for fear? Trust. Well, fear of what? What's she going to do? Well, she might go and clout me. She might get up and clout me. He's in a maximum security way. There's no way he can get out or his mother can get in, but let that pass. Right, she? She might. How old is she? Eighty-five. And she's going to do your injury, is she? Oh, she's still lively. Oh, she's still lively. Do you hear that? Oh, she might. She's still lively. Oh. My task is to bring today's reality, so I say... Eighty-five. How big is she? Five foot two. And how big are you? Six foot three and a half. She's eighty-five, okay? But uh, he has to sort of rationalise it, so he says, she's still lively. And what you find is, long after the abuser has died, they are still alive in the person's head. And you sometimes have to argue that point, but that is the case. They shouldn't be, and they will go once the frontal lobes start working again. This is eight weeks later, right? Well, put it, you can't take your own mother, can you? That's right. You know what I mean? And whenever she battered me, I, I mean, I never think, dream of lifting a hand to, to, to hit her. Even when I was 21, I was 21, I was 21, she slapped me across the face. 
When I was 21, she slapped me across the face and I slammed the door and went out and got drunk. And my dad came in and I ran out of the house. 21. So then slammed the door. And then just went and got pissed. <laughs> Yeah. And bottled it up. Yeah. And bottled it up, that's me, okay? And bottled it up. But now, you would stop her if she came to hate Oh, there's no way she would hit me now. What I'm doing here, and you have to be very careful about this, re-traumatisation is the easiest thing in the book, so you have to be careful not to re-traumatise. Remember, the axe is still falling, the rape is still going on, the mother is still battering, even if it's stopped in reality 50 years before. And if you say, how about this, and you're too fast, you will precipitate the abuse, the trauma again. So I'm, now this is eight weeks later, and I judge the time is right, and I say, okay, your mother's coming to hit you again. What are you going to say? Because uh, I'm a nice middle-class lad, and I do a lot of talking. He says... What would you say? I wouldn't have to say anything. I mean, if she went to slap me, I'd just hold her hand. I wouldn't have to say anything. I would just hold her hand. Do you know what that's called? That's called empowerment. And you can do it. <laughs> oh, what? Bit of humour, you know, pass the time of day. Well, he didn't have the confidence to do that before. That's what, what I'm trying to draw. I mean, if, it was, if this had happened years ago, when a doctor had took an interest, yeah. say when I was in my 20s, yeah. and said what you would said, yeah. and we conquered it, and then I went to the house and say, Oh, and I say, suppose I came in late and she says, uh, blah, 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 and she went to hit me. I said, Mother, you can't hit me, you know. I'm a grown up. <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> yeah. I said, you can kick me out of the house. Yeah, because it's your house. It's your house. house. Yeah. But you, you can't hit me. Don't try and hit me. No, no. But you've never said that. I've never said that. Up until the last month or two, yeah. have you? No. I've never had the confidence to say it, have I? That's right. You're brainwashed into fear, aren't you? It's yeah. like a brainwash. You're brainwashed into fear. He said that, I didn't say that. But that's my model, that's, he's telling me what's wrong. If a doctor had taken an interest when I was 20 and said what you'd said, none of this would have happened. Guess what the criminal justice system does? I slipped in under the radar <laughs> and I worked for five years until they found out what I was doing <laughs> and then threw me out. Cheeky lot. This is Bessel van der Kolk. He was a, a Dutchman who moved to the United States at 14. In 1986, 1987 I beg your pardon, I took a video of my first case which was a 40 year old woman who was grossly overweight and after 33 sessions, she told me that her father had threatened her life with a hatchet. She didn't tell me up to that point. She kept saying, well, I can't blame my father. I feel terribly guilty. I said, well, he's dead. I'd been a, I'd been a, a family doctor for 19 years at that point. I'd treated him, treated the family. And it made no sense to me that she couldn't criticize him. And eventually, she must have decided, well, this doctor's not going to go away. I may as well tell him. So she told me this incident when she was six, when her father cut holes in the bedroom door, appearing to threaten her life. Now, once she told me, I could assure her that a dead father doesn't wave hatchets. Think, once she starts thinking. So here's Bessel. Part of what I hope to do with my book is to encourage you to take more power. And when people tell you to give your patients bullshit diagnosis, like oppositional defiant disorder or bipolar disorder, they say, no, I'm not going to do that because that is nonsense. That's not what my patients suffer from. I want to be a real diagnostician. I want to really identify what my patients are suffering from and not some stupid list that was made up by a bunch of people who run a laboratory but never see a human being in their lives. So these are very complex issues that get played on very complex ways and have a lot to do with money and power, etc., etc. So good luck to you. <laughs> um, so this is the end of this chapter. 
In, this, in the three decades since I met Tom, we have learned an enormous amount, not only about the impact and manifestations of trauma, but also about ways to help traumatized people find their way back. Since the early 1990s, brain imaging tools have started to show us what actually happens inside of the brains of traumatized people. I happened again be lucky and be at the right time and the right place, and my group did the very first neuroimaging study ever uh, about traumatized people, and we found some very interesting findings. And what did we find on that first neuroimaging study is that when people remember their trauma, their whole frontal lobe goes offline. So the whole part of their brain that has to do with thinking, figuring things out, and telling you what's right and wrong, goes offline. The speech center of the brain goes offline. There's a big hole in the speech center. It's as if people have um, a stroke in Broca's area. And so people who are traumatized become dumbfounded. They are struck with speechless terror. That happened to show up on the very first neuroimaging study of trauma. That's interesting, because therapists tend to be people who love yakking and love talking. I love to yak also. I'm also a yakker, and I think that telling people your internal truth is terribly important. But when you come to the very core of your trauma, you're speechless. You cannot really tell what happened, because your brain is dumbfounded. And so for me, that opened up a whole quest, which happened to be a very joyful and interesting quest, and I'll show you some examples of it, um, of how do you get to that pain, that hurt, that frozenness, uh, by while you bypass language. And so uh, in the past few years, we did the first uh, NIMH-funded study of yoga for PTSD, and it turned out that yoga had better results in a very, very impaired population than any drug treatment had ever had on any traumatized population. He was describing a brain scan experiment. He said he was fortunate to, to be able to brain scan on people with trauma. And he put them in the brain scan machine and he played an ordinary audio tape and everything's fine. He then plays an audio tape of the gunshot, the car crash, whatever the trauma was. The frontal lobe stopped working and the speech center stopped working. Now I'd established this myself clinically with the help of wonderful people in 1986. It's really incredibly simple. Not easy, but it's incredibly simple. Traumatize a growing human being and they will not think straight. It's a defense. This isn't happening to me. They can't then say this has stopped happening to me unless you provide enough support. This is from the BBC um, <laughs> documentary from May. It is social defeat that is related to psychosis. By social defeat, we mean repeated experiences of marginalization, exclusion uh, and discrimination. Social defeat, social exclusion. Uh, the, uh, the British education system has a wonderful system that uh, if a child is disruptive, you exclude them from the school. Of course, they go and do knife crime, but I mean, that's not the school problem, you see. <laughs> what he says here is that if in infancy or childhood you go to five different nursery schools, your chances of becoming psychotic with psychotic symptoms later goes up 35%. You don't even have to leave the country for this effect to take hold. Simply moving to a new school and the social upheaval that brings can be a factor in developing psychosis. Simply moving to a new school and the social upheaval that it brings about can precipitate or predispose. And we found that greater number of school moves increased your risk of developing psychotic symptoms in adolescence. Every time you move schools, you leave your peer group and your support network. You leave your support network. You're only small, you know these people, you've got to know them, you talk and you joke with them, and then you leave. You meet a whole lot of other people. Maybe the next lot of people don't know you, so they bully you. You can see how it begins. Human beings learn. And if you mistrain them, 
they learn the wrong things and you start again as an outsider outsider so it's that chronic experience of being an outsider which we think is related to the development of psychosis so this is the group there are two people in it besides me one's frida and one's sam and what you do in a group or rather what i do in a group is let one person talk and then when they've talked for a while you turn to the other so what do you think of all that then and now turn to frida and say how does your experience agree with sam's so how does your experience agree with that is um very much the same did you hear the blocking gone in what way in fact, I find it so difficult to think, and not just think, I find it, to think about what's being said, so difficult. She's describing frontal lobe blockage. <laughs> I didn't tell her to say that, she's telling me. Wow, that's interesting. Why is it so difficult to think? I want to know why she thinks it's so difficult to think. When she starts working out why, she can start unpacking it. In this context, yes. we're talking about thinking about what we're thinking about. Which yes. Is... Right? In this context, she's starting, give her plenty of time. In this context, we're talking about what we're thinking about what we're thinking about, okay? Yes. How to stop our parents, stop us thinking. What I'm doing, it happens. How our parents stop us thinking. What I'm doing, block. It happens, block. But I can't think about it. If you can't think about something, anything can happen. But I can't think about the supermarket shopping when my mum's in the, my head either. I can't think about the supermarket shopping when my mum's in my head. What she told me later was, she's in the supermarket, she's shopping and she gets a bit stressed. She looks in the distance for her mother. Her mother died when she was eight. It's kind of a, an unreal survival pattern. And she's struggling to change it. It goes on everywhere, but here I can't. I'm trying to get on the point of what he's saying because yeah. it's relevant. It's relevant, yeah. And I can't think. I can't think. Probably. It's 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 probably. training. It's training, right? It's training. You've trained yourself not to think. Mm. Say that. The I'm suggesting this to her, and she says, mm. and I want her to say it. Okay, that's the difference. I've trained. I, I, I have trained. I've trained myself not to think. Yeah. And then she's demonstrating. This is how. This is. This is how. How I have difficulty thinking, right? Me, I doesn't faze me at all. And I now have to train myself to think. And now I have to train myself to. What do you have to think? Did you hear that? And now I have to train myself to think. That was smooth. This is better than, better than all the bloody drugs. Excuse my French, right? What the drugs do is turn your frontals off. It's the last thing you need. There's a, um, a bit more dialogue which I'd like to show you. How does your experience agree with Sam's very much? At the bottom there, how to stop our parents stop us thinking. See, she's got the overall picture and you have to drive it home so that she can unpack the terror, the speechless terror. Because what Sam says is, re is relevant. Yes, it is relevant. And I can't think. <sighs> I can't think properly. It's training, right? I'm explaining to her. This is called education. This is called emotional training. You've trained yourself not to think. Mm. Say that. Not, oh, all right. Say it. This is verbal physiotherapy. This is practice. This is get you, getting your speech center working. I've, 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 I've tried... And now I have to train myself to think, and she says it smoothly. What do you have to think, okay? Pushing the envelope further forward. What do you have to think? I have to, I have to, I have to think what I want to think individually. That's to say, she wants to take autonomy. She wants to have empowerment. She wants to be in control of her own mental furniture. And I'm offering her that. Because I believe it's possible. Talk to a million psychiatrists, they don't believe there's any possibility of change. <laughs> yes, and what do you have to think with respect to your mum? All the time I'm looking for parental figments, I'm looking for 20 foot tall 
people wandering about in their mental jungle. Hmm, um, I, want, I, I want her to go. Look at that. I want to think her gone. She died when she was eight. But she's still pulling the strings. I really have to believe that, that I want to think her gone, so that I can think, I can get, I get myself little rhythms and tongue-tied, things like that, but I'm, I'm getting a bit bored with that, so I change it. You have to look her in the eye and beat her, not in a physical, but in a victorious sense. I'm empowering her to be stronger than a dead mother. I'm stronger than you, Mum. Off you go. Now, Sam hears that and goes, <coughs> right? Because he can't do it either. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, strong, I'm stronger than you, Mum. Well, that wasn't very convincing, was it? I actually believe it, she says. What do you believe? Uh, that I'm stronger than my mum and that last one is smoother. All the time you're going for smoothity. Well then say so, not with blah, 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 it's called muttering. Come on, off the top, come on. I'm stronger than you mum. Still a bit feeble, isn't it? I mean, you know, it wasn't, you know, 100%. Sit her down there and say, hello mum, and tell her to go. Hello mum, I'm stronger than you. Do you believe that? Um, um, I can't say it. How much evidence do you need that the frightful homes go offline? I, I didn't tell her to say that. I can't say it. She wants to be able to say it. I want her to be able to say it. I'm encouraging her to say it. Why not? I say, well, I've got to do something, haven't I? Well, for thinking, uh, uh, speak for myself. Very good idea. Try it again. I'm stronger than you, Mum. Now, I move to Sam. So, what do you think of that dick? She's not good, is it? Mm. Doesn't bite straight away. What do you think? What's your comment on that diction? Mm, doesn't quite believe it. She doesn't, does she? No. Go on, tell her. Bleh. He's not going to do that. What about you? Are you stronger than your dad? Because I know, you see. Are you stronger than your dad? Um, 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 I don't think so, no. Well, I want you to say, Hello, Dad, I'm stronger than you. You're 70. Ha, ha, ha. All right. Okay. Hello, Dad. I'm stronger than you. You're 74. Oh, 74. It's gone up a bit since I last asked. What happens to you when you say that? You see, I'm going for the reaction all the time. I'm asking to him to observe his thinking apparatus from the inside. Look at that. A little, a little, a little tiny bit of relief. Ha! So if you said it and believed it, you'd have lots of relief. Is that correct? Probably, yeah. What do you mean, probably? I know the man quite well by this time. The whole object of the exercise is to get you some relief. A tiny bit of relief, do it again. See, I'm a, I'm a very hard taskmaster. Hello, Dad, I'm stronger than you, you're 74. <laughs> See the giggle? So what happened then? Um, like he dies or something? He's exploring, he doesn't know, he's never done it before. No, it's just real. You're stronger than him, he's not going to hit you, so please say that. Say that, please. If I'm stronger than you, you can't hit me. C -c can't hit me. See? It's coming. If only he believed it. What happened to that sentence? Say it again. If I'm stronger than you, 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 you can't hit me. Do you believe that? Partly. What do you mean, partly? A bit. What do you mean, a bit? It's logical, isn't it? I dare say, I don't want to see him. Look at that. I beg your pardon. I don't want to see him. I don't want to see him? What effect does that have? It makes me mad. No, no. It makes you impotent. It paralyzes you. I'm not looking at the person who's hitting me and he continues to hit me because I don't look at him. Hey, how about saying that? I like that. Off you go. I don't look at the person that's hitting me, yes? I've trained myself, he continues to hit me. And that makes me small and impotent. That's like keeping me at two years old. So my advice is to look at him, okay? Advice, you see. If I had a little thing to say here, then Frida comes in again and it's too late. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention.
thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob, for this wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. I think you got your message through, and it was really fantastic.